I am delighted to uh, briefly introduce myself, Lisa Richter, co-founder of Avivar Capital, and our wonderful panelists who are going to tell us more um, about their experience. So I'll just uh, briefly say we have Lolita Nunn, who is uh, Director of Investor Relations and Program at Potlicker Fund. We have Jamie Nichols, who's a director at Avivar Capital, and he's specifically involved with impact and uh, other portfolio management. And uh, Jessica Hazleton, who, is, uh, who leads the education innovation, innovation ventures at ECMC Foundation. Wonderful. Um, so with that, we're going to dig in. And um, we're going to ask each of our panelists to say a word about how they come to the practice of impact investing, and then why uh, portfolio management, including impact and financial reporting, are important within their organization. So Jesse, maybe I'll start with you, if you don't mind. Um, I just want to say it's so nice to see so many of you here, including some of our portfolio companies in the audience. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so as Lisa said, I run a program called Education Innovation Ventures, which is the venture arm impact fund of ECMC Foundation. We are a national post-secondary education funder, and we're focused in closing equity gaps for students from underserved backgrounds in post-secondary education. The fund itself makes early stage investments, so pre-seed, seed stage investments, sometimes debt as well, in both uh, for-profit companies that are very mission aligned, as well as nonprofit organizations that have some sort of earned income stream. And we really started our impact measurement journey at the very beginning of building this fund. Um, I come from an impact measurement background and felt from the earliest days that it was really important to define what we wanted to measure um, at the onset of building this fund. And uh, I guess in about two years ago, we had the pleasure of partnering with Avivar Capital um, as thought partners to really help us think through how to really refine the type of metrics that we're measuring and build a really um, robust, I guess, impact measurement system and tool for our portfolio companies. Great. Um, you know, Jimmy, I think I'll hop over to Lolita, if that's all right, and then come back. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Loli Tanan, the Director of Investor Relations at Pot Liquor Capital. And uh, just to a little background, I come into this work from two different areas, first working in the financial sector for 14 years, and then in the nonprofit sector. Uh, so this space of impact investing is really that culmination of my career journey. And in this space, I like what I like to say is reimagining how capital flows to support our most disinvested in communities. I, at Potlicker Capital, we are a national fund. We're a charitable loan fund. And we really uh, focus on that intersection of not only racial justice, climate, uh, but also social justice, where we provide resources to black, indigenous, Latino, and all farmers of color. So we're in that ag space. And we're just not your traditional charitable loan fund. What we want to do is provide reparative capital. And our way of looking at reparative capital is acknowledging the past harms and systemic issues, historical discrimination that still plagues many farmers of colors today. And we acknowledge that that should not be the burden of the farmer. And so we deploy flexible, catalytic capital, resources, wraparound services in a holistic manner to really build the resilience of farmers of color in America, rural America and urban America today. And so we really look at this as movement building work and modeling um, a way to really work alongside farmers of color in a new way. This is not transactional, it's relationship in nature. And when we show up to a farmer, uh, especially a farmer of color, you have to show up differently. You have to have some, build trust in a different manner. You have to be willing to come from outside of the, the office, from the ivory tower, put on some boots, and actually understand the seasonality and the cycle of the farmer in order to provide the best solutions possible. Thanks, Lolita. Jamie. 
Thanks, everyone. Uh, Jamie Nichols here. I'm a director at Avivar Capital. Um, and in my role at Avivar Capital, we support a variety of different type of investors, all of them uh, mission-focused and, and mostly focused on private markets, to um, analyze the ongoing financial impact performance of their portfolios. So that's kind of across different asset classes. That could be debt, that could be direct equity, uh, funds, and so on. Um, what brought me to this work is I, I had a lot of experience previously actually on the reporting side. So I uh, was managing a, a food bank where we had to collect information from you know 100,000 plus beneficiaries and I think came into this work understanding the tension between logistically capturing information where sometimes it's frankly a burden to the underlying beneficiaries, the underlying recipients, and also the real need to capture and showcase you know, meaningful impact data that helps steer decision making, um, refine your strategies, and so on. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks all. Um, if I could, I'd like to ask each of the panelists, uh, when you think about meaningful impact, which was a concept lifted up in the, in the session description, what are meaningful impact measures uh, for you? And I'm, I'm particularly interested in this because I understand, uh, Jesse, that you're driving innovation using venture capital. And, uh, and Lolita, you're really trying to redefine relationships using debt and, and grants. So, Jesse? Yeah, and I love the way that you just phrased that because I really do think that meaningful impact metrics have to be meaningful to you. I think you have to measure what matters um, to you and to your beneficiaries and stakeholders. And so it should look different. Um, it will look different with different investors for different portfolio companies. And I think that that's, I think that that's right. Like I think that um, you can build a system which in, in our case, we have both fund level metrics as well as company specific metrics. And I think that that's really intentional. It's intended to sort of to, to, to send this message that we understand as a foundation, we have stakeholders that we need to deliver important impact um, information in data and, and outcomes metrics too. And those types of things that are really important to us are around, for example, persistence for college students, transfer, completion, and access to um, family sustaining wage careers. And those are things that we do ask our portfolio companies, if available, to track alongside us so that we can aggregate those across the fund, across our portfolio, and really tell a shared story of the type of impact that we're hoping to make through our investments. But we also recognize that at the portfolio company level, each, each company is going to have specific and individual metrics that are really important to them and for them to tell their story most effectively um, and to really kind of unlock either additional capital in the future, right? Like make sure that um, companies have the type of information and data systems in place to be able to um, tell their story to future investors, and also to use that to really inform their customer base, um, to really share kind of efficacy and data around what they're doing so that people are bought in and are more willing to, um, to either buy those products or platforms or services. So I think it really happens on two levels, and I think the most important piece is that we're really thinking about what is important to our stakeholders, whether it's our board, our internal learning, to the field, and to the portfolio company and their needs. Thanks so much. Lolita? Yeah, um, the impact measuring, I agree, Jessica. There is um, different pathways and, and we're accountable to our investors as well. Potlicker uses program-related investments, grants, and recoverable grants that come from a myriad of different ways. And, and when I look at that impact piece, um, many times, I, I'm just gonna throw this out here, many times I wonder what happens to that information when it's shared. So we have investors or funders who send this list, how many acres, how many watermelons, what are the widget counts, and it's, what happens to that information? And, and so when we provide that back to the investor in the foundation, there's, there's no follow-on conversations that happen. So it, it often leaves me wondering, did it just get a checkbox checked and filed away? Uh, and so at Potlicker, what we want to do is really measure the resilience of the communities that we work alongside. And, and BIPOC farmers are, um, have been 
historically disinvested in, and so there's a trust issue that's often needed to be overcome. And, and as we're building these relationships, we're gathering lots of information. We want to measure the impact of our relationship with that farmer at day one. Are they connected to the community? Are they in relationship with others? Do, are they connected with distribution? Are, do they have um, crop insurance? And when we look at the relationship that we have with them day one, and then in the next year, how that's grown, year three, grown even further, and counting that as a way to measure how impactful that farmer is, not only in the community that they serve, their individual organ farm has been able to scale, has been able to connect to distribution, and then also we want to use their voice to inform policy. So building the resiliency and measuring that resiliency piece for our organization is what's really important. And it's something new and it's novel. And it's, it's going to change, I think I want to say, I hope it changes the way that many people look at just measuring the widgets. And it's actually growth and it's trajectory that's actually making a big impact in the community. Thanks so much. Jamie, your perspective is perhaps unique because you're so focused on coordinating financial monitoring and impact monitoring in, in a unified report. So as you think about what's meaningful in, in that exercise, what, what comes to mind? Yes, well, starting with the, on the impact side, I think that the most meaningful impact data you're collecting is something that the investee could hold up to a potential funder or a potential client. It helps give them traction. So I think sometimes we're in this practice of counting the widgets, um, kind of having maybe a focus on scale metrics, you know, lives touch, beneficiaries serve, that when viewed in a vacuum, it's like, okay, is, I don't know, is that good? Um, it's really important that whatever you're collecting, let's say it's an ed tech company, they could go to a potential client and say, well, look at how we're improving completion rates, we're, we're improving persistence. It's not just a one-way you know, value chain, essentially. Um, more to say, the other thing is I also think there's value in marketing materials. So how do you balance those two things? Because frankly, people do need to court funders with some quote-unquote vanity metrics. That's a real dynamic. Um, but I don't think that dynamic, the burden of that, of fulfilling that need should necessarily fall on investees. Um, financially, you know, it, what we see is there are a lot of different type of investees and what we would look for financially varies, whether it's an early stage company, a fund, a CDFI, for example. Um, but the one thing that is important is if they can't deliver on financial objectives, they can't deliver on the impact a lot of the time. So sometimes there is this, there's this movement to just kind of be impact only or focus on the impact metrics, where the financial metrics can be really important because they can help you um, support an investee at a time where they might be in a troubled position, so they can ultimately deliver on those impact objectives. Those two are intricately bound. Um, and the actual underlying metrics that drive that, you know, we could take this into a side conversation. There, there's a lot, and I think that some of those come from financial statements, some of those are more sort of KPIs that speak to volume, stickiness of customers. Um, and, and ultimately reinforce a lot of the impact metrics that, that we see and collect. Great. Uh, I just want to open it up for a minute in case anyone in the audience would like to either offer um, a meaningful impact measurement from your organization um, or, or uh, say a word about how having quality uh, portfolio monitoring, financial or impact, um, has helped the organization. We'll plow ahead, but I just want to be sure you have a chance to, to leap in if you want to. Uh, okay, great. We are going to go on to talk about what are the qualities of um, a, a successful portfolio management program? What are the elements? And um, Jamie, on this one, I might start with you because you've really been forced to give a lot of thought to that. Yeah, and I'll try to be concise. I guess that's the hard part. Um, I think one is that it starts from diligence. So when you have an investment thesis, an impact thesis during a diligence, you're very transparent about what that is with a potential investee. 
and that you kind of allow the potential investee, the potential partner to say, well, I think that I'm a good fit because we do this and this is how we measure this. So there's full transparency from the onset of the relationship, how you're compatible, how that's going to, how it, it, it meets that, that mission and impact thesis. So then during diligence to closing, to you know, post-closing, there's no surprise as to what your motivations are or expectations are as an investor. Um, sometimes there's a very well-intended push maybe to kind of reverse engineer um, metrics, which I think some, sometimes you can do kind of elegantly, but making sure that you kind of start during the diligence process introducing expectations and expected metrics and that's a conversation and it's bottom up I think is really important. This is gonna sound almost like trite because but tech enabled, you know, if, if, if an investee is expected to report certain things or you'd like them to report certain things, it should be as easy as possible for them to do it. They should know exactly what they're supposed to report. There shouldn't be this kind of guessing game and a lot of that, that convenience, frankly, I think is addressed by, by technology. Um, I think an, another really important element of that is what, what I just kind of mentioned before I hinted at is that it is, um, it's dynamic and it's kind of informed by the investee. So, Rightfully, problems change, you know, strategies change. So if a certain company, a certain fund makes a pivot, wants to do something else, that should be okay and your framework should be modular enough that it can capture that. So you're not kind of hamstrung into this, you know, reporting framework that's not relevant either to you or to the investee. So I think having that flexibility is really important. And like six billion other things, but I'm gonna stop. Maybe I'll just pop one question to you uh, before we pass it on. I know that sometimes uh, you've been faced with um, portfolios that have hundreds of social metrics attached to them. Um, any, any guidance on uh, you know, how investors or investees might think about streamlining their approach to the social metrics? Yeah, and I wonder how many this resonates with people in the, in the crowd. I, um, less. <laughs> <laughs> less is the main thing. I, I think sometimes people can confuse the volume of impact metrics for the magnitude of impact. So they say, I'm gonna have 30 impact metrics and all these different KPIs. Not only are you, it's gonna be really difficult to arrive at a so what with that level of volume, but it's, it's a huge burden on the investee. A lot of times that's not their core competency. They should be focusing on their products and services, which is not reporting um, or gathering some of those metrics. So I think it's really important to come to, I, I hesitate to have an actual number, but we'll say less than 10 real meaningful KPIs that are meaningful to you and to the underlying investee. Um, because it's, you know, beyond that, I, I really, I'd like to hear maybe from folks in the audience or other organizations how they actually make use of that data, because uh, it can be really challenging. Mm -hmm. And if I could throw out a question to the audience, um, how many of you, uh, if you're either running a portfolio and reporting to investors, or if you are an investor with a portfolio, how many of you think about the um, selection of your metrics in such a way that you can roll them up and see your impact across the portfolio? Great. It's impossible. I think about it, but it's really hard. It's, it can be very challenging. It, it absolutely can be challenging, but you know, even if there were a subset of the metrics that could be rolled up to kind of watch what a portfolio is doing, we think that can be helpful. Yes? So I just want to comment. We do a lot of but we always recommend if you have a diverse portfolio to actually have the metric of the percent of investees that are affected at their work, right? So then as an investor, you're funding efficacy, but then the particular metric can change based on the investee's focus. So you can be tracking performance without the particular metric that might change from sector. And how would you define efficacy then? Well, then that's up to the funder, but you know, there are different, in different environments, there are different definitions. I work on the developing market space, so mm -hmm. a couple, three different standards you can choose. I mean, there's, then it becomes an issue of what's your standard, and that's the unfortunate thing about IMF, is there's the proliferation of these. But it could be SRI score, or it could be uh, return on uh, other kinds of returns. Yep. And to some extent, it seems that it would have to do with delivering on what the expectation was 
of the investment um, originally and or as the strategy may need to change over time. Back to that last minute quote, we also advocate feedback loops with the stakeholders so that you can change, and that's why you would change either a contextual factor. So uh, with the portfolio combination might be three what we call apex indicators, one that would measure efficacy, one that would monitor context, and one that would measure the feedback loops with the stakeholders. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, how do you think about the elements of a successful portfolio management system? Thank you. I was I was really going to, to jump in and maybe take a step back for a second and say, I know I'm up here on the stage, but I am super aware of the fact that we've spent so much time thinking about our impact measurement process, and yet we still have a really long way to go. And so a lot of the things that Jamie said really resonated with me. And we started with a laundry list of metrics in the beginning, and we have been calling and cutting them down, and we still have more to do. Um, so I think that this is all happening in real time, and I just want to be—I just want to be really transparent about that. Like this is really hard. Uh, we're fortunate that we're in kind of a narrow, a more narrow industry where um, some of the metrics and outcomes that are most important to us can roll up, and we can maybe talk about impact happening across the fund, and we recognize that that's not maybe the position that a lot of other funds are in. Um, but I will just say it's been iterative. Like we've started in one place, we've evolved multiple times, we will continue to. Um, I think it's just, we have, you know, we, we recently, as of this year, started developing, um, started utilizing or leveraging, I would say, a new framework. Um, and it's not new, it's new to us, the, um, the IMP, the Impact Management Project um, framework. So we've really been thinking about how do we start at the earliest, earliest stages, um, really, having these conversations in partnership with prospective portfolio companies and investees um, to really understand what matters to them, what they think is feasible to measure and to track. And we do ask for targets. Um, they're not meant to be punitive, and they never are, but just to kind of get a sense of where somebody is trying to go and recognizing, to your point, that things will change over time. Um, and we have to be flexible. And we are very like comfortable being in that position, but it helps to create a bit of a roadmap. And so as we get feedback, we do try to incorporate it. We do make changes you know, as we go. Um, we really are looking to, to decrease the burden, I think, that, that investees feel, um, both at the time where they're developing initial metrics and throughout the process of tr reporting on them. Um, in fact, Jamie and I have spent a lot of time talking about how much we would love to just change the word monitoring. <laughs> like, that just doesn't seem to be really in the spirit of what we're trying to do and really it, it sounds again like punitive it sounds very big brotherly like we are really think about thinking about this as partnership um, and we want to be you know to the extent that we can be in the trenches like we want to be there with our portfolio companies we want to help um, we are not there to just you know hey send us a report once a year and you know we'll do with it something maybe, or it goes on a shelf. Like I totally agree, <laughs> Lolita. Um, that is not the essence of what this is about, and uh, it's not perfect. Like it, it's just it's a constant journey, I think, for us. Thanks. So I Jesse. know that didn't fully answer your question, but I think it's worth saying. That's moving us forward. But and before I hop to Lolita, um, I'm just thinking about the fact that you're investing in uh, venture back companies. Are you documenting reporting requirements in a side letter, or how is that um, documented as you enter into the investment? Oh, great question. So, like Lolita, we use program-related investments. So, I'm not sure how many um, how many people here are familiar with this tool. It's like a wonky IRS designated tool for right a form of impact investing. And as part of that, we do document every investment in a side letter. Sometimes it's embedded into a loan, but we do for our venture backed investments, we do have a side letter where we are very we clearly articulate sort of the reason behind why we're making the investment. So stating our charitable the charitable impact. Um, we we have even we have some other kind of languages around, around reporting, so a lot of the financial reporting that is quarterly, and then we detail what our annual impacting requirement, impact requirements look like. Um, so everything is there, it's very transparent, and then we ask the investee to work with us, like what, does this resonate? Does this make sense? Does it seem feasible? One of the things we haven't discussed is that we do ask for data to be disaggregated um, by race and ethnicity, gender, parent status, Pell eligibility. We are trying to understand to what extent these innovations and companies that we're supporting are closing equity gaps. 
um, or are helping kind of move the needle on closing equity gaps. And, you know, we understand that that's not maybe feasible for everyone, but we do think that sometimes having some of that um, outlined can be aspirational too. So maybe an early stage company, some of this is not realistic in year one. That's okay, maybe not in year two, but maybe it is something to aspire to in the future. And I think that's also where you know, a national foundation or an impact investor can play a role in having that conversation and thinking about if we're not there today, maybe how do we get there? Thank you so much. Lolita? Yeah, this, this, uh, I like this question because I'm on the receiving end where we are accountable to reporting to um, our investors and uh, grantors. And, and I appreciate that being in conversation and also being flexible is very important when it comes to reporting um, on the metrics and co-designing. So in the early stages, uh, like you said, Jamie, where you're receiving a term sheet or you're, you're uh, sharing the information of what metrics are going to be needed down the line, there's that opportunity for the investee um, to come back and say, you know, there's th this looks a little extractionist in nature. How do we um, work together to make this a little bit more relatable or something that we can adhere to? And it's it's all in the relationship. It's being transparent. Uh, many times a grantor uh, or a grantee or an investee takes it and they don't feel empowered to actually go back to the investor or grantor to say, hey, we're not able to do this. But if you lay that out in the beginning, like that, that we are here to support you in the work that you are doing, and we wanna set you up for success, having those transparent conversations and having that door open to where the person can come back and say, can we have a conversation about this? Because this is not gonna work. And you being willing to say, I understand. And yes, we can have that flexibility to make this work. I love that comment because um, there's a, a fair amount of research in the field. Um, uh, the lean research uh, work that's being done now out of 60 decibels and came out of Acumen Fund um, that talks about how investee organizations are uh, accountable to their communities and you know, using survey tools and so on to, to make sure that the end user or end beneficiary of the program is, is really benefiting. Um, the reason I bring it up is you know, when you say to an investor, this is not comfortable for us, you're not saying, I'm not willing to be accountable. I think, you know, because you're performance driven for sure, but you're saying, you know, these, these metrics may not be the ones that are most important um, for us. And having the flexibility, it's not, a, it's not boilerplate. These aren't loan documents. You can ebb and flow. You can make some changes to meet the needs of the very folks that you're working with. Great, thanks so much. Jamie, I'm gonna go back to you before we um, leave this question, just because I know that you monitor investments that are both market rate, quote unquote, and below market rate. And do you notice any qualitative differences um, in, in, that, in those um, different um, venues? Um, well, one thing that comes to mind is a lot of the below market rate investments um, there might be concessions because they're so impact forward. They could be a nonprofit. So that muscle for impact reporting is usually already built out. So the classic example could be like a community development financial institution or another nonprofit. They, they are usually in the business already of collecting and reporting on impact. Whereas a lot of the more market rate investments might have a lot of great KPIs and reporting, but it's probably tilted more towards, you know, um, financial metrics. Um, so it can be more of, you know, one thing I'd like to just highlight, and it's, it, it, I think it came out of ECMC Foundation's work, is in some instances this could be an early stage startup that says we don't have this impact data that we haven't collected before, and through a conversation you arrive at some impact metrics you report on. Um, in one instance, you know, they didn't have that muscle. It was a kind of a market rate investment and um, helped develop a template, helped develop metrics through another investee or another investor we work with who was asking for impact metrics a few years later, we saw the template that ECMC essentially developed. 
So it just goes to show that even though there might not be that muster capacity for the market rate investments, I think that if you kind of collaboratively work with them to help devise and sort of formalize some impact metrics, they can then use that to court money and, and to satisfy the demands of other funders. Um, they just might not be as experienced in working with you know, impact investors and just need some guidance. And that, that has happened more than once, where we were, saw a very early stage company, didn't have impact reporting, kind of developed a process, and then a few years later, that same process developed, fulfilled sort of the reporting requirements of you know, a number of investors. Yeah, great point. Did you want to leap in on that at all? Okay, well, I mean, I'll just mention that I'm sure many of us in the room have seen the increasing use of diversity, equity, and inclusion surveys of investee organizations and asset managers across the um, return spectrum. Um, and it's my impression that that is starting to change how the asset managers, particularly on the market rate side, um, are thinking about their, their hiring and uh, their decision-making process. It's still way early days, but I think um, folks are beginning to realize they, they can't fail to consider um, the, the issues of equity and how they're, they're running their programs and their, their funds. Um, Lisa, I'll just add to that, and this is actually happens a lot on the grant side of our house, but we do include that type of questionnaire, mm -hmm. and we do use it as an opportunity to have a follow-up conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so if, 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 we do, if the, a company is not maybe, um, you know, there's an opportunity to sort of be more diverse or inclusive, we, and we sort of see that through the questionnaire, we can have that conversation and ask, like, what are the plans for the company? What are you thinking around hiring? Um, again, it's not meant to say, like, hey, you're good or bad, or there's no, like, judgment necessarily. It's just more about opening a door for a conversation and to kind of understand a company's intentions as they, as they, as they grow. Yeah, and, and really just making sure that they're aware that this is an evolving norm in the field, and really you can't fail to take this into account. Um, let's take a minute to talk about where the field needs to go in terms of portfolio management, both financial and um, impact. Um, and I'd open it up to any of the panelists on changes that you might like to see. I have a burning one, so I'll just jump in quickly. Because um, I do see one of my colleagues here in the, in the audience. And one of the things that we've been working on, those of us in the education space, or a couple of us, I should say, in the education space, is recognizing that we're all asking for relatively similar metrics at the fund level and thinking about how we might be able to come together and create some sort of standardization around those metrics so that we're not asking each of our investees to report differently on persistence. Like, are you you know, semester to semester persistence versus annual persistence versus, and the cadence of reporting. So some of us are asking for annual reporting. I think that's fairly, becoming fairly standard in the industry, but some of us are still asking for quarterly impact reporting. And so we're trying to find at least both around cadence um, and um, like, lo like the logistics of actually collecting a report, we're trying to kind of come together so that we're not being like overly burdensome um, on shared investees, but then we're also thinking about the content of what we're, what we're capturing, what we're asking people to report on on an annual basis, and can we come to consensus across there as well? Um, because it is, you know, I think that, I think reporting can be a real benefit um, to, to, to some extent for a lot of the reasons that Jamie spoke about, but, if you're being asked for 12 different sets of metrics from 12 different investors, it's not going to feel that way. It's going to feel incredibly burdensome. And so this has not been an easy effort, but I think it's been a really important one. It's been ongoing. Um, it will continue to be, um, we're constantly kind of open to feedback about that as well. Um, but we're really striving to build a shared measurement approach because we really think that's important for the field. How many folks out in the audience are involved in any effort of that sort? That's great. Um, I think many of us feel that this is absolutely essential um, in the field at this point. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, when we go through due diligence with the uh, investor and there's the opportunity to share due diligence across uh, different organizations, I would appreciate having the same opportunities for reporting metrics, uh, put it in a cloud, go there and pull out the information. And, you know, I also want to understand what 
the goal of the reporting and metrics is going to accomplish. So there's a two-way street where we're giving you this information, you're requiring this information. What are the what are the goals? What are we accomplishing? And if that needle is not moving, what's going to happen? What do we need to do to ensure that that needle is moving instead of just counting and reporting and nothing is changing? Yeah, super helpful. Um, you know, I'm about to go to questions, but I, I would welcome thoughts from the audience. How would you like to see the, the field of portfolio management change, either on the financial side or the impact side? I mean, I was thinking about the fact that it used to be pretty standard that an investor would have a site visit with an investee once a year. And, it, you know, for a variety of reasons, I think that that has become less the norm. But certainly in that kind of meeting, there was always the chance to talk um, in more conceptual terms how are things going and, and to think about um, whether the needle is moving. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, Potlicker, we're in this unique space. We work with accredited and non-accredited investors. We take in uh, PRIs, grants, recoverable grants. We redeploy this to farmers of color. And we are in relationship with the community that we serve. We go to site visits. We are willing to get out there. I, I live in Michigan. I go visit Farmer Melvin. I carry my boots in my car because I know I'm walking the land with Farmer Melvin. And so these are the things that we are invested in the success of the folks that we, we work alongside. And that's the same type of mentality that needs to happen the other way. Um, become invested. There are some great organizations out there that do this. Uh, 11th Hour and Schmidt Foundation and Katali, they are some great folks who work alongside the folks that they're supporting, want to understand the work that they're doing, and then there's the follow-on. So when we're working with a farmer year one, we, we're, they're the first people that, uh, we're the first people they talk to and call when something is happening in the organization. We're going to be there to help de-risk whatever is gonna happen. We do not wanna write off a, a loan. So we're gonna be able to come in, bring other folks off the sideline, restructure debt, and make them a success. Continue to help them be successful, continue to help to connect them to distribution, continue to help them build a community of practice. That's what it's gonna take from all, all sides of this work. It's a great point, and I think that comes back to your point, Jesse, about let's move away from the concept of monitoring to perhaps partnering or whatever the term might be. Um, great, well let me take a look at some of the questions here. I do appreciate that they are, seem to be pretty legible. Uh, for Jessica, what is your check size for the investments <laughs> that you do? Um, and what is an impact side letter for? And then how do you line up size of investment with realistic expectations about tracking impact? Okay, so with, if it's okay, maybe find me after and we can talk about check size. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate it, but maybe in this forum, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the side letter. So um, the, the reason for the side letter is that as a program-related investment, there are three things that we sort of have to abide by. Um, they're really kind of nebulous, but they come down to the first thing is that we cannot make our investment strictly for the appreciation of income. Um, so we're not looking to really profit from the investment. It doesn't mean we can't, but it can't, it's not the driver. It's not the reason we make the investment. The reason we make the investment is the charitable purpose. So that is, that, that is written into the side letter. It's almost maybe stating the obvious, but it is important that it is in writing. Um, we sometimes have a redemption clause in our side letter to say, if you really deviate from this thing that, you know, we are discussing and the, the sort of the, this trust that we've been building around this is so this is sort of what the investment proceeds are for and this is sort of the the purpose of the investment we would have a conversation about whether it makes sense for us to continue to remain invested in the company um, so that's we really lead with impact and that's really because this is sort of again that IRS designated tool um, the other purpose of the side letter is to be really clear about reporting requirements right so we really want to be upfront and transparent about what the expectations are around reporting, the quarterly financial reporting and annual impact reporting. It's not, it's not a one-way conversation. Um, 
typically people don't have side letters, so we draft it and we have some like sort of a template, a starting point, but we really look to this to be, again, iterative and something that's done in partnership. Um, what was the other part of the question? Because there were like a couple it, components. Yeah, there were a couple. It was the, um, the ones that will be in a side conversation. And how do you correlate the size of the investment with the impact of reporting expectations? Size you know, of In investment. other words, for a small investment, oh. does that mean a lesser reporting burden? You know, th this is a great question, and I, I, we think about this actually around due diligence, like how do we right size the check to the amount of due diligence we're doing? Um, this is a conversation we have had extensively with Avivar too. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually quite complicated sometimes because from our vantage point we feel, you know, if a smaller check size in a really early stage company where there aren't a lot of metrics to track with, there isn't a long track record um, or traction really, we feel maybe to some extent maybe should require like less due diligence and there are other parties that feel that sometimes earlier stage companies require more due diligence. So I don't think the field has really um, like come to agreement in terms of what, how to right size checks with due diligence and with impact reporting. Um, I certainly think financially there are just fewer metrics for a, an earlier stage company. Um, the, the track record, again, is not there. You don't have the same KPIs. Um, but you can start to build together. You can start to say, at some point in the future, what would this look like and how do we get there? Um, with impact, it's the same. We typically have impact metrics that we, like, we discuss, and we recognize that not all early stage companies are going to start reporting on those immediately especially with a disaggregation of data. That can be really hard for some companies that are working with universities and colleges, for example, where they need data sharing agreements in place. And we recognize that. We don't expect things out the gate um, or ever if that's really not going to be realistic. But I do think it's, it behooves us all to have a conversation and to explain why those things are important to us and then think about how we might be able to get there together and make sure that that's also a priority for the company. So I don't think it's about forcing any metrics on a company that doesn't inherently want to be doing that work and tracking that, that those metrics themselves. Great point, and great point that we don't yet have agreement on size and how that correlates to the intensity of the diligence and the reporting. All right, it's possible for impact to be negative how do we encourage funds to report where the portfolio is not doing well? Um, and I think that means maybe bringing about unintended consequences, not just failing to perform to financial expectations. How do I convince my fund to report the whole spectrum of impact to LPs? Okay. <laughs> You ask. <laughs> you have a conversation. I, you know, it, you you have to have build that trust so they're willing to even share the good, the bad, the ugly, and be willing to pivot and help them transition. Uh, it's the same with when we're working with our our portfolio of farmers, and they're having some issues. They're not able to purchase um, supplies to keep the business going. We want to be there when they're having these issues so we can help them pivot, so we can help restructure that debt. It's kind of that same lens you need to look through. And those ongoing conversations and, and having uh, the door open to say, we're here for when things are not going so well, so that we can tap into our spheres of influence and maybe bring others in to bring provide solutions that work. Jim? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because with something like this, um, I feel like, especially with funds, they will be more willing to report um, being out of line with financial expectations and laggards financially, but impact, that's almost like a no-fly zone. Um, and it's weird. It's like, they, why why will we say, well, Mark and this company hasn't progressed, they didn't meet their, their benchmarks, but you don't usually see that same narrative with impact reporting. It's like any bad news is horrible news, or not even bad news, just that's not in line with expectations. And I think especially with, uh, you know, in, if you're investing in early stage companies, you're investing in an idea, 
And ideas don't always work, and that's okay. That's what like guides, that's how you refine a strategy, that's how you, you know, improve outcomes. It's, you know that just especially in venture capital, that's, that is what you're doing, is you're taking huge risk and trying to find a few successes that a lot of times will compensate for the ones that don't work out. And I think it's that same dynamic is at play on an impact front, and that's okay. I, you know, it's just, I, it, I realize in the, our work, we ingest reporting from like 200, 200 plus entities, and we see on uh, you know, fund statements a lot of narrative about market conditions adversely impacting you know, financial targets of companies. But I guess to the question, we rarely see anything about impacts not performing in line with expectations. And I think that that's, those, that's the good stuff almost. That, and that's, oh, that's okay. And I don't, it's a great question because I don't know the way to change that narrative. The one thing that does come to mind, and I know this is kind of veering off course a little bit, is to the point earlier, I think you can have impact reporting that is to guide decision making, refine your strategy, and then also like marketing. And I think that so many people look at impact reporting as marketing that they don't want bad marketing, and they're conflating those two things. So the more that we think about it as like, well, one is to guide decision making, everybody needs to market their company, their business, and that's okay, but that shouldn't be the driving force behind the, the metrics you're collecting. Counting widgets, counting live start, all that stuff that, you know, the vanity metrics. Um, so I think it's understanding that those are two separate buckets and the less you kind of confuse them, the more you can report on the bad stuff because people have the right expectations. Super interesting. Um, Jesse, did you want to add at all? Okay. I mean, maybe so, one thing is just yeah. we do we do a sort of impact risk assessment at the beginning, uh, at the initial, during the due diligence phase, and so, impact risk assessment. Uh, so what we are, um, and Jamie has been really instrumental in helping us think this through. But like we are looking, or we are considering what could go wrong from an impact perspective, yeah. or what what might deviate <laughs> or be like off course from an impact perspective. Um, and so it is part of the calculus. Like it is something that we take into account. Um, and then I think going in maybe eyes wide open or more aware of things also helps us, again, have those conversations and check in um, and, and maybe try to make sure or try to work together to kind of ensure that um, those, those like we're st we remain aligned around impact. Um, I, I think there is a difference between like negative impact and just maybe not having the intended impact like at the rate maybe of the intention, uh, intended impact. So I think those are also like two different conversations. Is yeah. something adverse happening, right? For example, in our case to students, like are they taking on too much debt that they can't repay um, from a program that was meant to help them, um, you know, like decrease debt load? Like that, that's a different negative impact than we thought we were gonna reach 50 students, but this year we reached 10. Like those are two different stories. Yeah, this, I mean, this is a super interesting question. Um, and may, I'll maybe say a, a couple of things. Number one, I would just suggest people might want to go over to the, the F.B. Heron Foundation website where they're organizing approaches on net impact. The, the net contribution, I think, is the way they, they frame it. Um, just the understanding that any investment could have either a positive impact or a negative impact, and they're trying to get net positive impact. And they've done a lot of thinking about it, so it's, um, it's quite provocative. Um, the other piece is that, um, you know, unfortunately we are in the era now where um, many of our early prayers that impact investing would be mainstreamed are being answered. <laughs> and along with that, um, there is in fact uh, marketing hype. And so um, I, I think it's incumbent upon all of us in the field to uh, be alert to that risk. Uh, and even while we for sure want to see better marketing and storytelling. And one thing we haven't talked about that much today, but what I think is important to many of us in the room is how do we take the quantitative data and turn it into compelling stories that really change the narrative about the kinds of communities, the people and the places um, that we're investing in. But, um, but that has to be accompanied by the transparency, Jamie, that I think you're talking about, that not everything works and we're still learn, uh, learning by doing. Um, and if we don't have that trust, uh, we really can't continue to move um, the field in, in, in the right direction. So super, super interesting question and lots to think about there. Let me come to our last question. Um, what can or should funders do to validate and edit 
the link between their investees' theory of change and the metrics they're actually collecting. What do you do when these don't align? I don't know if you may have seen that, Jesse, or you kind of talked about, Lolita, sometimes a tension between what the investor wants to see and what you think is m most connected to what you're trying to accomplish. Well, there, there's that, the transparency and having those conversations, too, where if the funder is asking for something that you're not able to produce, have, letting them know that this is something I'm not able to do. Um, yeah. It's an, it's an interesting question because having a theory of action and metrics in place, um, I would say on the earliest stages, like th that would be pretty advanced. So we don't, um, we don't always even work with investees who are there yet. So I don't know that I can really address what, you know, what happens if those things aren't in alignment because um, I think we're kind of at that, st at that starting point still around like how do we work together maybe to develop a theory of change or theory of action and, and then identify the right metrics. So I appreciate the question. I think it's um, at the stage that we're at, it's not something that we, we see often. Uh, well, I, I, I don't want to plug a certain like framework or anything because we work with a lot of them and like a lot of them, but um, I know we've worked a little bit with like the impact management framework or impact management project, impact frontiers. And I found that to be like especially compatible with like plugging into a theory of change. So like on the kind of that would sit, there's a lot of um, mapping to do to the outputs and then you need some assumptions to go from outputs to outcomes. But um, I think that that's been a very useful tool to sort of draw a bright line between the, the effectiveness or the performance of the impact portfolio and a theory of change. In terms of the, I'm thinking of some ex examples without naming actual examples. So clearly like in the impact management um, framework, you think about the who, well, what they're doing could be right in line. They're providing you know, an intervention that's improving enrollment. But let's say the actual who that they're serving is not in alignment with your theory of change and it's really very uh, privileged you know, students who don't otherwise really need uh, you know, that particular intervention. And I think you can see, it. Of the frameworks we've seen, that's been a very effective tool for looking at a theory of change, sort of on a parallel path as um, your 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 you know impact portfolio. And, and a theory of change is just that it's not it's supposed to evolve as the organization moves and grows. So the theory of change that you have in year one is going to look different than year five, and it should it should not be the same. The metrics should evolve and change as the organization evolves and changes. Great. I know that we're just about up on time. Um, I think the word convenient was also used in the session description. And I, I just wanted to say we didn't dwell on it much, but Jamie lightly referenced the fact that there are more um, tech-enabled platforms to lessen the burden of um, portfolio reporting, both financial and uh, social metrics, and um, we're, we're super excited to dialogue with anybody about those because we think that those are going to greatly um, help the field in, in, in improving the portfolio management. Um, welcome any other comments or questions as we wrap up. I think I heard you to say that in DEI uh, sort of monitoring and reporting, <clears throat> how can that be done to protect the individuals? Um, any any thoughts on that? I have like a word. I just that's a great question. I don't. I, a very short story. I know it's late on time. We used to serve. Uh, we had a, a farmers market that served migrant farmers, and we wanted to collect all this DEI information, income information. When we started doing that, it dropped by like 80% because people were like, I am not filling out those forms. And it hugely compromised the work we were trying to do. Um, I think one of the things, it's just a side note because that sensitivity is very real. Um, in, I know in our work, in some instances, if that is a real barrier collecting the information to, and there's a real case to be made that it's like, you know, you can't, you can't do your work if you're trying to collect that, I think we would guide not to collect that information. 
More often than not, it's not a huge impediment, at least in our, our you know, use cases, where it could be, you know, even the, the, man, the fund management team, the company team, the governance, and then the underlying beneficiaries, if, if possible. Usually that, especially with something like the tech-enabled companies, it's a component of the product to have an intake that collects that, and we ask for it. We are also aware that there are instances where it is, it would um, really challenge their work, and we don't, we don't advise collecting it.